Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today. We will be covering filtration flow control and sparging basics with advanced porous metal media for industrial and OEM applications. We'd like to thank you all for attending today. Our speakers for today's meeting, uh, we have two applications engineers with us today. Uh, first, we have John Rosenberger. John, do you want to quickly say hello? Yeah, hi, Dan. I'm uh, happy to be here today. So John has been an applications engineer with Mott for nearly 19 years, primarily supporting our semiconductor and healthcare business units. So he has quite a uh, extensive array of experience with porous metal and its applications. We also have Aditya Bhavate, uh, applications engineer with Mott. Uh, Addy, you want to say hello? Hi everyone. So Addy's been with Mott for five years in R&D and app applications engineering. And he's also a former Hoganist uh, employee, so he has quite an extensive experience in powdered metal and uh, filtration and flow control. So I know a lot of you are existing customers, but for those of you who are not, we just wanted to give you a quick rundown of who Mott is and what we do. So we've been around for 60 years, uh, service, uh, servicing a lot of the most demanding customers in the world, the most technologically advanced customers in the world, such as NASA, and dozens of Fortune 100 technology companies. We have the largest install base of porous metal filtration and fluid controls in the entire world, ranging from uh, incredible applications such as the Mars rover to implantable medical devices, semiconductor and industrial applications. Uh, the most extensive material selection ranging from cryogenic temperatures to all the way up to uh, 3000 degree plus Fahrenheit. And we also have a customer innovation center where uh, we invite customers on site for lab testing, prototyping sessions to increase their time to uh, design and new products and, and commercialization. So our agenda for today is we want to review the principles of filtration flow control sparging. We want to understand porous metal and its capabilities. We're going to see where porous metal can be used to increase your process uptime, your yield production, and also your shelf life of your products. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, next generation technologies and advancements in this market, and then we're going to do a quick wrap up. Uh, just to note that uh, we're not going to be doing a live Q&A session today. Uh, the reason for that is we find that we have customers with some sensitive needs um, and sensitive information that they want to talk about. It's typically not suitable for a public webinar. So what we encourage you to do is ask questions using your sidebar on the left of your screen. And those questions will not be public. They will be transmitted to Mott and we will respond to them immediately after the webinar through email. So feel free to ask questions through there. And additionally, you can download some popular resources from Mott, such as our technical workshop overview and uh, some of our porous metal overviews so you can get a little bit more information. And before we forget, um, we just wanted to mention to you that we are doing three on-site technical workshops through Q2 this, this year for customers who qualify. To see if you do qualify for this on-site technical workshop, just contact your Mott representative. Uh, what we'll do is we'll send out a couple engineers to your site. We'll train you on the latest in filtration and flow control. We'll do some problem solving sessions and some one-on-one -on -one breakout design sessions with your engineers and Mott engineers. So it's quite comprehensive and it's uh, a really great way to understand particle science and different type of techniques for design and engineering. So with that being said, I'll do a little bit less of the talking. We'll turn it over to Addy and John to go over filtration, flow control, and sparging basics. So right now I'll turn it over to John. John, you want to quickly take the audience through filtration basics? Yeah, sure, Dan. Thanks, and thanks everybody for joining today. So when we design a filter, um, we need to consider all these parameters. We want to make sure that the, our filter material is compatible with the fluid that you're you're using, whether it be liquid or gas, you need to know, have some idea of what kind of particle filtration you're looking for and at what efficiency um, levels you're looking to capture that those particles. And obviously, we're going to need to know what flow rate and what kind of pressure drop your system, it, it, you're looking for in your system. And just, just to add to that, John, uh, materials compatibility may also be related to the atmosphere or the environment that the part of the filter is being used. If it's high temperature, corrosive atmosphere, we, we need to make sure we select the appropriate material which will withstand those conditions besides just the fluid that's that's flowing through the part. That's, that's exactly right, yep. 
Okay, so this is just a, a, a tabular representation of the filtration efficiency performance, and it's, it's, it's shown by media grade, and when we say media grade, we, that's referring to the nominal pore size of the filter material, and I won't go through this in detail, but there are, there's, there's a very different efficiency rating between gas and liquid, and I'm going to get into the, the more the complexities of gas filtration uh, on the next slides. So liquid filtration is basically a sieving process. Um, I like to think of it as the, the strainer in your dryer where your lint catcher, it catches the material on the surface of that strainer. And that, that's how liquid filtration works. With gas filtration, it is, it's a lot more complicated than that. Sieving is only one of the capture mechanisms in gas filtration. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about some of the other capture mechanisms in gas filtration. So John and Addy, are, are, do you encounter quite a bit of customers that are not aware that there are multiple types of particle capture for gas and they believe that it's like a liquid filter where you have to sieve everything? Yes, uh, and it does happen quite often that, that the customer's understanding of filtration is anything and everything that gets captured just on the surface is how they would define a filter, which is true in case of liquid filtration, but, but when it comes to gas, we rely more on depth filtration rather than just surface capture of particulate. What do you think, John? That's exactly right. There is uh, even, even customers who are using filters in gas, we, we spend some time explaining to them the, uh, the mechanisms of gas filtration. And this is, this is a pictorial representation of the, the major capture mechanisms, and it's all particle size dependent. So we have sieving is, is, is one of the capture mechanisms for very large particles, and the very small particles diffusion is the primary mechanism. And diffusion is the, it's the natural motion of very small particles, and they eventually come in contact with the filter material. We have interception, which is kind of the medium, a little bit bigger than diffusion size particles, where they eventually through the course of the torturous path of the filter media will come in contact with the media and be filtered. And then inertial impaction is the next larger size up where the, the mass of the, the particle is such that its momentum or inertia carries it straight into the filter media and out of the gas stream. So John, I see interception twice here, and I know Addy just mentioned the concept of uh, surface versus depth filtration. Is that what this is showing, is that particles are getting captured in the depth of the porous media? Yeah, that's exactly right. So with, with interception, the, the part, particle size is such that it, it rides in the gas stream for a longer period than say the, the smaller or very larger particles. So filtration depth is designed to make sure that we capture that size particle, um, which we call the most penetrating particle size within the depth of the media. And this is, this is a graphical representation showing the, the relationship between particle size and filter efficiency. So if you look, if you take diffusion, for example, it's, it's, it is the dominant mechanism for filter efficiency at the very low submicron particle size. And if you go all the way out to sieving, it's a predominant capture mechanism for very large particles greater than say one micron in this case. And then the other capture mechanisms are, have varying degrees of efficiency versus particle size. So when you're getting into more fine filtration at the submicron levels, it's really important to have that thick porous media so you can catch, capture the particles through interception in the future. That's right, and, and when we design the porous media, we, we verify um, that media by challenging the, the media with the, the particle sizes that, that are the most difficult to catch. And just to add to the comment that Dan, Dan you made, it's not, not just the thickness that's important, it's also important to understand we're selecting the appropriate media grade because the bigger your thickness of the particle or the filter, higher is going to be your pressure drop. So it's important for us to find the right balance between thickness and the appropriate media grade to give you the most optimized results in terms of filtration as well as pressure drop. Okay. 
Great. So uh, we'll now go into flow control basics. Uh, John, you want to talk to us a little bit about our design for flow control? These would be our, our typical flow restrictors. So we're looking for, for laminar flow through these parts. Our typical design, our standard design for our flow restrictors is we have repeatability and accuracy to within plus or minus seven and a half percent of the design flow rate. We have a, a myriad of different hardware configurations that we install our porous metal restrictors into. And again, the compatibility thing is, is the same as with the with filters. We want to make sure it's compatible with the fluid as well as Addy mentioned with the environmental conditions. And, and just to add, add to that a little bit, John, and correct me if I'm wrong, we, we have good experience dealing with several applications which required much tighter tolerance and accuracy beyond just the 7.5%. So we have, we have the capabilities and experts to design something to meet the most challenging applications out there. Yeah, that's right. We, when, when required, we can, we can significantly improve that 7.5%. And some of the, I know, I know two of the common methods of flow control that I, I've seen are, are flow orifices and porous metal restrictors. And I see people who are confused what the benefits are of each and when to use one or the other. So, Addy, can you explain to the audience? Yep. And, and that's, that's, again, a typical nature of inquiry that we see pretty often from our customers where they say that, hey, I have this orifice. I was wondering if we could replace that with a, a porous restrictor, what, what benefits would I see or what disadvantages would that come with? And uh, on this slide, you can see the most common benefits of going with a single hole orifice. Uh, one, obviously, is the cost. It's not a technically challenging process to manufacture an orifice. That's why it's a low cost commoditized product readily available off the shelf in online portals and other uh, hardware stores as well. In addition to the uh, the cost, the other benefit is the choking of the flow that happens because of a single single stream that's present through the orifice. However, that also comes with a couple disadvantages. One of the things is if there is a particle which is bigger than the size of the orifice, the orifice is going to get clogged, and there's going to be no flow whatsoever through the uh, through the orifice. Uh, you you. Typically, because it's a single uh, single hole uh, in the orifice, you see extremely high gas exit velocities, which not necessarily result in a laminar flow of the gases, and you see a lot of turbulence and, and on the downstream side, which may not be acceptable for certain critical applications. Other thing uh, which I would partially consider as a disadvantage is uh, they are usually standard designs. It's like they cannot be customized to any specific application or connection or filtration efficiency. They come in standard sizes and specifications. And if the application can use those, that's a great choice. But if not, then the only other choice is, is porous restrictors. And the biggest advantage uh, between a porous restrictor and an orifice is the laminar flow. You don't see high gas exit velocities. It's a much smoother transition through the cross section of the uh, the restrictor, which results in severe reduction, significant reduction in the uh, the turbulence downstream. Being porous metal, it gives us the flexibility and freedom to accommodate or adapt that in several different sizes, shapes, and hardware connections. So we can highly customize something based on what the customer requires. These advantages obviously come with a high price, a high premium, which would be the disadvantage of a restrictor, which is the cost. Uh, certain applications may have certain cost barriers, which may prohibit them to move to a restrictor and stick to an orifice. And another smaller disadvantage would be it does not cause the choking of the flow which the orifice would do. Um, one other thing I would add to that is when I talk to customers about orifice versus uh, restrictors, when you're buying an orifice, you're buying the tolerance of that hole. When you're buying a porous metal restrictor, you're buying a specifically designed and calibrated part to your system conditions. Um, and, and that uh, process critical um, performance, that, that's really important. So it's interesting you touched on process critical because I, I think this is important for the audience to know. Um, a lot of times our customers use porous metal restrictors in what we would call mission critical applications. So you send a satellite up into space, you can't go back and take your flow orifice out if it's not working correctly. Or if you're well, working on a liquid chromatography machine, you can't take your gas flow restrictor out 
after you sent it to the customer. So is that typically what you see as well? Yes, and, and one of the things is, like you mentioned, the mission, mission critical applications where you have a satellite in space and you want to make sure you have a solution which is going to last for the time that the satellite is supposed to be out there. And you don't have the liberty of sending a technician out there to swap out an orifice which got clogged because someone didn't do the calculations right. You want to have a solution which is intelligent enough and technically capable enough to handle unpredictable issues that may happen in outer space or in the gas chromatography applications. Okay. So now we'll move on to sparging. Addy, do you want to talk to the audience a little bit about sparging design? Absolutely. This is one of my favorite applications here at Mart. We see several customers approaching us with, with sparging inquiries. And just to cover the basics, what's, what's mentioned on this slide is the idea behind finding an appropriate or designing an appropriate sparger is to be able to determine the suitable bubble size, which in turn is controlled by the pore size of the sparger. And to do that, we need to understand how the pressure and flow parameters of the gas and liquid behave in those applications. And in order to give the customer the most optimized or most efficient sparging solution, the biggest and the most important step in designing a sparger is for us, for the engineers to calculate the required surface area, which will give them the required gas exit velocity and gas flow to maximize the gas to liquid contact. And the second most important thing is that the sparger needs to be able to, the customer needs to be able to adapt the sparger into the existing system. And they don't always have the liberty to change the connection type or the gas inlet type. So we can basically customize it to, to use any type of connection that the customer would prefer in their application. And looking at this, uh, the next slide, uh, basically just an example of the benefits of switching from a drilled pipe to a mart sparger or uh, sparging technology in general. A lot of times customers don't really understand the difference between a dip tube or a drilled pipe and a sparger. The biggest difference is you have fixed number of holes in a drilled pipe at fixed sizes. Whereas in a sparger, you have several hundreds of thousands of micro pores in built into the uh, into the sparging assembly. And the, the biggest advantage of that is the pores are not spherical. So it's a torturous path, which results in much finer micro bubbles than what you would typically see in a drill pipe, which in turn increases the gas to liquid contact area significantly. And Long story short, the benefit to the customer or to the application is they see a tremendous reduction in gas usage and also a reduction in their cycle time. So the throughput can go up significantly if they switch from a drill pipe to a, a sparger. Okay. And some of these, the applications for these types of spargers, so it's pretty much anything where you're trying to introduce a gas into a liquid? Uh, it's a little bit beyond that. Most, I would say about 80% of sparging applications are when you want to introduce a gas into a liquid. Uh, the remaining 20%, you see some inquiries, uh, some interest where you want to inject steam into liquid for heating purposes. So that's technically also a sparging application. It's not necessarily gas to liquid, but it's more of a steam to liquid contact. And sometimes you also see gas into solids type kind of application where the customer has some powdered media sitting in a tank and they want to keep it aerated or suspended to, to maintain that level of suspension or aeration, they, they want to inject a certain amount of gas. So sparging can be used in those applications as well. Okay. And these are very popular and I believe it's food and beverage and biotech. And yep. Uh, food and beverage, cell culture, biotech, so certain pharma applications also need sparging. Uh, certain oil and gas industries also need sparging. Okay. So now we're just going to go into porous metal and its capabilities. Again, Mott's been doing this for 60 years, so we have quite a bit of knowledge uh, regards to uh, how to manufacture this and what it's used for and its uh, versatility. So, uh, Addy, can you take us through how this is manufactured and kind of some of the options? Absolutely. And uh, what you see out here on the slide, slide number 19, is the typical manufacturing process of a sintered metal part. 
as always, the starting material is the, the alloy that you select. Uh, the, the powder that's used to manufacture a part needs to be highly irregular shape, which helps in from a manufacturing uh, standpoint. The porosity is defined by the, the powder size that you select. So you need to have a good understanding of what powder sizes result into what porosity or what media grades. Uh, the powder is then uh, filled in a, in a dye uh, based on the shape and size of the part, which is then compressed using hydraulic or pneumatic presses, uh, which results in a, what we call a green part, which is a semi-structurally solid part. That's not the finished product because it doesn't have high enough mechanical strength to it. So what follows after the pressing cycle is, is, is the sintering process, which is a uh, a diffusion bonding process uh, which is created using high temperature in a controlled atmosphere which creates diffusion bonds between individual powder particles to give it the mechanical and structural strength and once that part is made to qualify it for a specific porosity there are inspection methods which the one listed out here is a bubble point test method uh, method which which uses the pressure required to generate the first bubble that comes out of this porous media and that defines the pore size distribution and the nominal pore size of the part. So I know that our porous metal media is used in a wide variety of different industries. Uh, starting with the top left here we have microelectronics which is semiconductor manufacturing work, which we're talking parts per billion filtration so very very fine particles. We also uh, do a lot of work in process systems, which is your oil and gas and chemical uh, processing customers. Then we do a little bit more on the healthcare side, which you uh, would have implantable medical devices, uh, liquid chromatography, gas chromatography, lab equipment. And then we also have our OEM industrial, which is just about everything else in between from uh, aerospace and defense, food and beverage, which we've already mentioned. Now, seeing that we have this many different applications and different markets, could you explain to customers maybe why they would choose porous metal over, let's say, a plastic or a cloth in these markets? That's, uh, that's a very typical question that we hear from our customers seeing the cost barrier between plastic and, and metal, but the customer needs to be aware of, of the significantly higher benefits of switching to a metal, uh, metal filter in terms of longevity or the life of the filter itself. We have filters in the system with our customers which have been there for over 20 years without any issue and no replacement needed whatsoever. Uh, the high mechanical strength, so if there's a application that involves several levels of vibrations or uh, unexpected uh, mechanical aspects to it uh, which a plastic or a teflon may not be able to withstand porous metal has no problem handling those conditions the porosity is much more uniform and controlled because we control the powder size distribution up front so that in turn controls your porosity downstream uh, in terms of applications where you have acids or corrosive chemicals involved, uh, plastics have absolutely no chance of surviving those, uh, those applications. So metals obviously becomes the most natural choice in those areas. Uh, porous media is fully cleanable. Uh, you can backwash it, back pulse it to, to prevent any clogging that may have uh, happened over a period of certain time. And I see, John, you wanted to add something? Yeah, just um, to build on your the um, additional strength of the porous metal in, in the semi-world, for instance, the, uh, the polymeric filters, they have a limited uh, differential pressure performance. So for uh, situations where there's a high differential pressure potential anyway, um, the metal is a better source. And also, metal filters are not flammable. There have been cases where polymeric filters, when exposed to the right condition, can um, start on fire. So um, that would be another advantage. Right. So would you would you guys agree with the statement that typically there's some sort of unique condition that the customer has where they say it be corrosion or heat in which they need to have a porous metal filter for and they can't satisfy that with the plastic? 
That, that's absolutely true. And just to add to that, it's also the cost of replacing plastic or uh, polymer filters that you need to consider when making a decision to switch between plastic to, to metal. Uh, obviously, uh, there are advantages of metal. There are going to be advantages of plastics and polymers as well. So we need to find the right balance based on what the application requires. Okay. And I know porous metal is quite versatile in, in its design and manufacturing. Can you take us through um, maybe some of the customization options that customers have at their hands? Yeah, Dan. Um, so customization is really what we focus on pretty heavily here. So there's some interesting um, photos up there of some of the things that we've done. I mean, we customize based on certainly the alloys that, that Addy talked about uh, before, certainly the different media grades, but we're, we also do many different types of hardware configurations, for anywhere from pipe fittings to compression fittings, um, VCRs, any, any kind of uh, interface requirements or connections, uh, we, we will work with customers to, to customize for their needs. And uh, so I'm assuming there's probably about a virtually infinite number of hardware connections that we can do. It's just depending on the, the, the piping or fittings that the customer is working with. Is that correct? That's, that's absolutely true. And, and, and if you uh, look at the, the, the database of products that we have customized, I think the number is well above like 50,000 right now in terms of different media, different connections, different alloys, and that number is always going to keep growing. I, on an average, we see about 100 customized solutions that we develop every six months for our customers. Okay, great. And lastly, we'll go into uh, porous metal applications. Uh, so here's some general applications that, that we offer to customers each and every day. Uh, this is not all inclusive. I can tell you that there's probably hundreds of applications we've done over the past year. But John, do you want to take us through uh, some of these general applications? Yeah, sure. And, and we've, we talked briefly at the beginning about gas and liquid. Um, there, there's all kinds of where we're filtering oils and, and uh, water and all kinds of gases, semiconductor gases. Um, we do sampling. We sample for uh, uh, stack gases in the petrochemical area. The flow control, again, restrictors in satellite systems, um, flight, other uh, aviation, aviation control. control. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, breathing systems, there we have porous metal and uh, scuba equipment. And then gas to liquid contacting, again, that's the sparging for uh, pH control, carbonization of, of um, uh, food and bev, um, and then oxygen stripping um, for uh, product preservation. Okay. And now we'll go into some specific applications. So um, the gas stack sampling filter that we kind of referred to on the previous slide. Here's a picture of the actual product itself. Uh, do you want to take us through uh, maybe some of the details behind it? Yep, and uh, I think this is a common requirement in the petrochemical industry where you have a lot of gases that are generated as a part of the process and to monitor the pollution and particulate level in the exhaust or the chimneys at, at these plants, it's important and it's sometimes even an emission standards requirement to have these type of systems in, in, in place so you continuously monitor uh, your pollution levels and, and your contaminant levels. So. MOT has a good variety of IGS, what we call inertial gas sampling uh, systems, where you can install it in, in your process without disrupting the flow of the process. And at regular intervals, you can pull a sample through these systems and send it to your analyzing uh, equipment or lab to make sure that your pollution levels are in control. Okay. And apparently we were on the Cassini space probe about 20 years ago. Um, I was not around for this application, but I know this is something that we're quite proud of. So uh, do you want to take us through? Yep. And uh, this is one of the several applications that MART has successfully developed solution for the space programs. And uh, this was highly successful uh, a few years back. And if you see uh, on the top right corner of the uh, slide, you see uh, encapsulated flow restrictors. And these, uh, these were used in in what they call attitude jets uh, to, to draw basically a compressed uh, hydrocyan gas in order to uh, steer the satellite at the right angles and right directions uh, while in space. 
So is this the, the same application I hear about uh, ion propulsion systems uh, kind of controlling the flow of xenon gas in order to similar, sim similar concept, uh, slightly different application. Okay. Interesting. Okay, and then uh, a third application is oxygen stripping in wine. Yep, and this is the probably the most common application we see in the, the sparging uh, side of our business. And uh, basically, oxygen in any food product, be it liquid or solid, reduces the shelf life or uh, the quality of, of food in general. So it's, it's extremely important for bottled beverages uh, to make sure that there is no oxygen present uh, in, in the liquid that they're, they're bottling, and wine is no exception to that. So. Uh, porous metal sparges are basically used to add nitrogen or uh, carbon dioxide, which which will help in stripping the oxygen, thus giving you a much higher shelf life. Okay, and next we're going to move on to uh, next generation development and design in the fluid filtration and flow control. So uh, 3D printed porous is a new uh, capability that we're looking at. And uh, Eddie and John, I know you know quite a bit about this. Can you take the audience through it? Yeah, so um, Dan, we've developed uh, the ability to create porous uh, metal structures through 3D pin printing. Um, there's, there are some uh, advantages to that over conventionally pressed porous metal. The main advantage is we can create unique geometries that are not capable of conventional forming methods. We can print hardware uh, right onto the, to the assembly with the porous metal, which eliminates welds and other joining methods. We, the uniformity of the structures is very good, and it's very predictable and repeatable, and it is lighter weight. Yeah, I, I believe this opens up a lot of possibilities for our customers. So say if they had an opportunity to use a cone for their filtration, um, they might have to use a cup currently with traditional manufacturing. So this opens up a lot of opportunities to not only get better performance, but uh, uh, a smaller footprint with some of the things our customers are doing. Is that correct? Dan, if I can just jump in. One other thing uh, which we need to project out here is in conventional manufacturing using press and center, we cannot have sharp edges or corners because of the limitations or feasibility in terms of manufacturing. But 3D printing overcomes that barrier and it's practically possible to have sharp edges or even spherical parts. As you can see in one of the images out here, we could literally print, 3D print a porous ball uh, of stainless steel. And, and like you said, a, a cone or any other weird shape is highly possible because of 3D printing. And there's practically no limitation to the size of the product. We can just make multiple pieces and put them together eventually. So. John, um, yeah, so the, uh, and to add to that, um, it allows us to produce a part that is exactly the, the shape and size that our customers need rather than having them to adapt to our conventional uh, geometries. So yep. it's a big advantage for, for special applications. Okay, great. And uh, you both know quite a bit about CFD and some of the applications. Uh, this technology has been around for a while, but we're using it quite a bit more in, in filtration and flow control for, for modeling. So uh, can you take us through? Yeah, that, that's right, Dan. So um, we, we now have the capability to actually fluidically model performance of our material in, in specific applications. We, if a customer supplies us their, their system um, requirements, uh, pressures, and fluids and fluid um, parameters, we can create a model that will uh, predict the, the performance, the pressure drop and, and flow parameters. Um, th this, this helps us to uh, dial in a, a very precise design uh, very quickly without elim or eliminating multiple trials with uh, prototyping. And just another thing we can add to that discussion is there are certain applications that go in highly corrosive or high temperature applications, which are practically impossible to replicate in a lab setting or to, to validate on a prototype level. So fluid dyna dynamics or CFD modeling helps us predict the behavior of porous media in challenging uh, con conditions. Great. 
And then our we have our new uh, newly commissioned customer innovation center. Uh, some of you have dealt with some customers that have came and visited us. So can you tell the customers a little bit about this? Absolutely. And this is uh, I'm, I'm heavily involved in this site as well. It, it's more of a a platform for our customers to build a partnership with Mart, where they can bring their team, visit our facility, interact with our lab scientists, PhDs, people who have several years of experience dealing with porous media, metal or non-metal, and bring the concepts that they have in mind or problems that they're facing and conduct like a brainstorming session with our experts to come up with potential solutions or what type of testing can we do. It also gives them the ability to experience some of the capabilities that we offer in terms of our lab services or media characterization center where looking at the equipments and capabilities that may trigger more ideas as a, as a group exercise to, to potentially solve a problem or improve efficiency or other benefits that Porous Media could offer uh, at their end. And uh, Addy, um, I, I believe we've had a number of um, successful visits from a broad range of customers. Absolutely, I think we've had over a dozen customers uh, in different areas visit us already and they, they see the value and that's that's why we we encourage more customers to participate in this program with us. Yeah. I, I've seen a couple customers cut weeks, potentially months of design mm -hmm. into less than a couple days. Absolutely. So, um, definitely heavily encourage people to at least check it out. We're going to wrap up our webinar here. Um, just one last uh, a uh, reminder that we are offering free on-site technical workshops through the month of June for qualified customers. If you are interested to see if you qualify, you can contact your Mount representative or use the info at mockcorp.com email listed below. Again, we'll send scientists and engineers to your site. We will do some problem solving sessions tailored to your company's needs. And then we'll do our one-on-one -on -one breakout sessions with your engineers to uh, give you some process and product design consultation. And this is an all-inclusive event and it's free through the month of June. So feel free to inquire. And that's going to officially wrap up our webinar today. We'd like to thank you for attending. Uh, our emails are listed below. If you did submit a question using the uh, GoToWebinar chat, we will receive that immediately right after the webinar and we will answer it, answer it ASAP. Additionally, if you have some specific questions for the presenters, we have our emails there below and feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we'd be happy to speak about your application and design considerations. So thank you again for attending today. Uh, Addy and John, any questions? Parting wood, words for the uh, audience? Or? Um, just one thing, if you have any filtration flow requirement, uh, you know where to find us. There's no limitations to what we can do and what we can design. Uh, we love challenging applications and we are ready for your phone call. Yeah, and I just want to thank everybody for joining today. Okay, so thank you everyone. We hope you have a great day. Thank you.